This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Today we are discussing with George Nash, the contemporary state of American conservatism. George Nash is the Dean of Historians on American Conservatism. His book, The Conservative Intellectual Movement in America Since 1945, just hit its 40th anniversary date. It's read by many to understand conservative thought in America. He is also the author more recently of Reappraising the Right, as well as he has recently edited two volumes of speeches, writings, and essays of Herbert Hoover, that were published by the Hoover Institution regarding FDR's New Deal and foreign policy, as well as a George Nash is a prolific uh, writer and thinker. George, glad to have you on the program. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be in this conversation with you. So, George, on June 16th, 2015, uh, perhaps a date that will live uh, as one that changed the course of uh, American politics, certainly uh, conservatism in America, Donald Trump came down the escalator at Trump Tower and announced his candidacy for president. I remember watching the announcement for for my own amusement. Uh, I remember laughing watching him coming down the escalator uh, with his hair in tow. But uh, now that we look back, we know that was that was the marker of something um, big uh, in our politics. It was a dividing line the date that Donald Trump entered the Republican uh, presidential race. So provide us, if you will, um, uh, an analysis of why it was that conservative intellectuals were negligent in understanding uh, his impact and how he would shape the race. I mean, a lot of people who write about politics dismissed him, but it seems particularly noteworthy that American conservatives missed this man and missed the attraction he would have uh, to many voters in the Republican Party, a party conservatives thought they owned. Yes, uh Initially, I think very few commentators uh, of the left or the right, uh, conservative intellectuals included in that category, uh, took Donald Trump seriously. They thought of him as a uh, as a reality uh, TV star, a, a mogul, uh, a man who had made the headlines in the tabloid media in New York City for decades. In other words, not a serious thinker, not a serious policy wonk, uh, not the kind of a person you would think of as a presidential candidate. In other words, a, uh, a sideshow candidate, a, a fringe candidate at best. Uh, and I recall one uh, conservative intellectual saying, well, this will peter out over the summer after the American people get over their initial amusement. So there was a, a tendency to dismiss him because he did not have any of the conventional uh, characteristics one associates with presidents. He didn't have a whole policy staff, uh, speech writers and the like. Uh, he didn't have much of an organization. He had personality. He had flamboyance. He said uh, things that, that garnered uh, attention and even anger quite quickly. But uh, nothing. none of that seemed serious. I think what they failed to see was that he began to have a connection early on with a significant disenchanted group of what we call the base of the Republican Party, the conservative base overall, or people who were assumed to be conservative at the grassroots. And he uh, he established that connection, I think, by by his willingness to transgress the ordinary boundaries of political discourse. And so we then have to ask, why were so many people willing and ready for that kind of transgression, if you will, that kind of unconventionality uh, by uh, Trump in his uh his whole style in his uh, cont- in the content of what he spoke and the issues that he chose to emphasize, including political correctness and immigration. So we have to ask, why did the conservative intellectuals, among many others, uh, miss the connection that he was beginning to establish with the American people? And that gets us yeah. into a, a deeper level of discussion. But uh, maybe you have a follow-up at this point. So I was thinking about Jonah Goldberg uh, here, uh, because he has said, and he's is sort of you know admitting his own blind side or his own, um, you know, blind spot in this regard. He said, I assume that those uh, who vote uh, for conservative candidates or for Republican candidates generally were on board 
uh, with ideas that conservatives like me, uh, referring to himself, had expressed uh, over the decades and understood things like, you know, why we don't want government involved in health care, uh, uh, understood uh, competition in, in education policy, for example, understood, uh, you know, free trade, these sorts of things. And yet uh, they preferred Donald Trump, uh, a candidate who on many conservative issues was uh, off uh, key or in direct opposition. And so Goldberg says what it revealed is uh, intellectual conservatism was actually a lot smaller uh, than he had thought that there were, you know, that maybe you had a lot of voter, you had a lot of writers and thinkers, but you didn't have the number of voters that you once thought. And as the Republican primaries unrolled and we saw Trump winning, we saw Trump staying at the top of the polls, we saw Trump staying at the top of the polls even after his, his numerous uh, comments, which many people thought had just would end him immediately, and yet they didn't. And so I guess that's that's part of this is um, conservatism wasn't nearly as deep as people thought. It wasn't uh, the ideas weren't nearly as widely held as as many of us had assumed. There was something else going on out there. There was, and and I kind of liken it to there was a sovereign people out there that thought they were just being completely ignored. Yes, I think uh, let's uh, let's go back a bit in, into recent history. In, in 2009, the United States, in policy terms, underwent a lurch to the left uh, with uh, the Obama administration's uh, um, major policies, both uh, the economic expenditures and then Obamacare, particularly as a uh, uh, as a representation of all that he stood for: progressive interventionism, top-down management of the private sector, etc. And um, there was a reaction against that. Um, and to back up a little further, uh, we are now going to be talking about populism, what that means. I would define populism very simply as the revolt by ordinary people, so to speak, against the um, those who presume to be their betters, against uh, self-satisfied, overbearing elites. And there are left-wing uh, populism, uh, varieties of populism in American history, uh, going back, you might say, to William Jennings Bryan or even further. And those left-wing forms of populism have attacked elites in corporate America, big money. But there are also conservative uh, manifestations of populism from time to time, particularly uh, since 1945, that take their aim not at big money, but at big government, at public sector elites, and what we now tend to call the bureaucratic administrative state. And Reaganism, in some ways, was, in my interpretation, a populistic libertarianism of the 70s and 80s, which was saying that we the people are sovereign, and we the people, said Reagan, are those who control the government. It doesn't control us. And what I would say started to happen in 2009, 2010, was a revival 20 years after Reagan left office, approximately, of what I would call this kind of Reaganite populism, we called it the Tea Party, and it was a reaction to the lurch to the left by the Obama regime. But that produced results in the 2010 elections, and then again in 2014, results at the polls, but that those results did not translate to the satisfaction of the Tea Party uh, and other conservatives into policy changes in Washington. And so what happened was that the populism of the Tea Party conservative variety morphed into a, an internal revolt against the vehicle of the conservatives, historically, recently, the Republican Party. And so it became a kind of internal battle between the, the, the populace, the, the, the insurgents, and those in Washington who, in the view of the insurgents, did not were either ineffective or were cowardly in trying to confront the Obama regime. Now, you have to take also into account another underlying factor, which is from 2009 on, we have had in technical terms a recovery from the Great Recession. But it has been, most people would say, an anemic and uneven recovery. And there were many who felt left behind economically. But added to that feeling of being left behind at the grassroots now, who had conventionally voted conservative when they had the chance in 2010, 2014, added to that feeling of um, being left behind economically was a feeling of disenchantment with their own leadership. And so in their, I think, uh, 
anger at being condescended to by Obama and even by the Republican elites, or so they perceived it, in their anger and, 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 and despair even, as Charles Murray has so well documented in his studies of the white working class, as we now call it, uh, they began to discard their conventional thinking, uh, the limited government uh, low t- taxes uh, conservative agenda of, of Reaganism, and began to look for someone who was simply going to speak to their needs. And Trump stepped in there, and thus we found that in that kind of crisis atmosphere, people were jettisoning their traditional shibboleths, their traditional inclinations, and the conservative intellectuals were discovering that the that the conservative principles that they had been expounding were no longer, uh, as, as, uh, as slogans at least, appealing to the grassroots that wanted something more drastic because of the despair they felt and the, and the anger they felt at being disrespected both uh, economically and culturally. So Trump st- steps in with, a, a, with in effect, a, a new kind of populism, I would argue, a kind of hybrid of the old left-wing and the old right-wing varieties. Uh, because Trumpism, as I would call it, is really going after both elites, not only the Republican Party establishment, but the conservative intellectual establishment, which overlaps with the Republican Party, but is not coterminous with it. So Trump then, um, in some ways, it seems to me, um, exemplifies a, a kind of a new s- scrambling of our political uh, battle lines. Uh, he has, for example, talked now and is talking as we record this interview in November of 2016, he's talking about having a great expenditure program on infrastructure, something one would tend to associate with liberal Democrats. He is not uh, abiding fully by the the fiscal orthodoxies of yesteryear, uh, and he has shown this ability to to shake things up and go after elites of both kinds in this strange uh, hybrid that uh, confounds many of the experts who tend to we've discussed already to uh, underestimate him but i think the appeal he had was of the of the the outsider and in some ways the strong man the guy who's going to shake up the establishment uh, and the establishment is perceived yeah. at, by the base as being uh, you know corrupt and, and ineffectual so we've so, got so we've got really i mean listen to your analysis here it's impossible to understand donald trump i think without obama and and the ways in which obama governed, uh, uh, on the one hand, but then also this failure of the elites, a, a, and a failure of the elites that predates Obama, I think, also in uh, you know, the failure, the, the, the effect of losing wars, or, or the effect of not actually, I, I say losing wars, but the sort of catastrophe chaos that followed our invasion of Iraq, and, and really the failure, it seems to leave some sort of long-term, long-term peace and stability in Afghanistan, despite all of the resources we spent there, and then also you add into that another failure of elites, which was the 2008 crisis, financial crisis, and then as you've been you know, talking about the tepid recovery we've experienced, and then you add into that Obamacare passed in the face of popular opposition, a major reworking of American health care policy, yet done on a strict party-line vote in the House and in the Senate, and done without deliberation, and done without compromise, really pushed through almost, you could use a football metaphor, you know, we've got to get this in the end zone by any means uh, necessary, by any means that we have at our disposal. You add all of those things together, and you start to see how the finely honed analysis of conservative ideas get tossed, and get tossed in favor of something very muscular like sovereignty, something, uh, sovereignty of borders, sovereignty of the people, these things have to be reasserted. So we, we actually then need to go back to fundamentals in, in an analyzing this phenomenon, and it really was a perfect storm in a sense because uh, in, that, in those circumstances, the people who felt disenfranchised uh, and left behind economically and culturally uh, were, were looking for any, any way out. And so the old, the old conventional 
phraseology of limited government, constitutionalism, free markets, and so forth, the lower taxes, uh, suddenly those sounded, I think, rather stale and trite and empty uh, to many, many people. I'm not saying that's a correct perception, but it is a perception that they had. And one thing that I think the, the conservative intellectual elite did not catch on to was the 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 depth of this uh, uh, alienation, if you will, this disaffection uh, that was felt by many people who had presumed were presumed to be, you know, reliable social conservatives or whatever, and also uh, this uh, this feeling of. of um, uh, alienation extended to many who were nominally Democrats, or maybe might have been Reagan Democrats, so to speak, 30 years ago, or people who had simply tuned out um, and had not voted very much in recent decades, which may help to explain the uh, the failure of the polls to predict accurately uh, what happened in the Rust Belt states. Uh, we might want to talk about that a little later yeah. on, but I, I think then that um, the conservative uh, intellectual community uh, did not really sense how deeply Trump was appealing to people who were willing to overlook ideology because they felt a kind of existential crisis. And I'd have to say that's true of some of the social conservatives. I think an aspect of this uh, uh, recent outcome that has not been sufficiently reported is not just the uh, is is not the um, the so-called uh, revolt of the white working class and so on that's been much analyzed and discussed and properly so, but also the the sense that I I uh, felt as I tried to monitor developments in recent months the sense that I felt among evangelicals and uh, Roman Catholics of a fear literally of persecution by a uh, an aggressively secular uh, state under a Clinton administration if Hillary Clinton had been elected. We'd already seen examples of this friction in the Hobby Lobby case, the Little Sisters of the Poor case, and, and the whole argument over transgender bathrooms and the like. Those social issues were, were out there, and although it didn't get as much attention from Trump, he did ritualistically at least uh, address some of these these issues uh i think that there were segments of the populace in the conservative side uh who were willing to overlook trump's lifestyle and his you know his manner of speech and so on uh because they sensed that the alternative was literally going to be uh a d drive to uh marginalize uh, christians from the public square and not leave them alone and i have seen some recent data that many of uh, the many catholic voters evidently at the last minute toward the end uh switched uh their allegiance from being presumptively pro clinton to being for trump and that uh, trump's uh speech speaking about uh, uh late term abortions and so on in one of the debates was a very influential factor for them and also as we have heard it discussed over the year, how can evangelicals support such a man who seemed to be the antithesis of, uh, of a lifestyle that evangelicals uh, would, would prefer, I think, at least for the grassroots and evidently for many of the leaders of the evangelicals as well, that they, it's not that they condoned his, uh, his uh, faults and flaws and sins, but they felt that the larger threat to them came from a, uh, a disciplined state uh, organized against them. So they had yeah. to take their chances with Trump. So I think the social conservatives, although they may not uh, be uh, central to the analysis, uh, were were in some ways yeah. important here yeah. in their voting pattern. Well, you know, some, some data points here that underscores your analysis on social conservatives, but that I've read, uh, Sean Trendy of Real Clear Politics, the evangelical vote for... Donald Trump was larger than the black and Hispanic vote for Hillary Clinton combined. Hmm. Now that is now that when I, and I read that I, that is interesting. Uh, w one thing that makes that interesting is we keep hearing the declining uh, evangelical vote, the declining uh, ability they will have to influence politics, as opposed to say, uh, you know, George W. Bush's presidency when they were uh, very very influential uh, in his administration. And yet you read that data point and you think. Yeah, you know, what I think is, uh, well, evangelical uh, Christians are evangelical, uh, and they don't necessarily diminish. Maybe, you know, maybe they keep spreading and growing, uh, uh, and, and, and it just gets dismissed or it doesn't get seen uh, because, uh, right, uh, popular mainstream media outlets don't necessarily understand uh, religious phenomena 
in America. I think your point on, on Catholics is well taken. It also seemed to me Donald Trump, sh- you know, changed what what is cultural conservatism or social conservatism and sort of recentering it around uh, patriotism, around the need for borders, around citizenship. I mean, all of these sorts of things that people thought were, ma- were had been dismissed or weren't really discussed now came to the forefront. In the campaign, it became, in effect, a new part of the culture war was, you know, sort of a, a patriotic identity uh, in that regard. And, and of course, most evangelical Christians and uh, Catholic conservatives can easily sign on to that. And if you think about it, you know, you think about Mike Huckabee's campaign, Rick Santorum's campaign, Pat Buchanan's campaigns in the 90s, that was always there. But those guys sort of got overwhelmed by their own, you know, religion. Uh, their own religious appeals, and Donald Trump never got sidetracked by that. You know, he was able to make a properly populist conservative appeal, and that, that's kind of my next question for you. You know, you famously in your in your book, you you conservative intellectual movement in America talked about three groups: classical liberals or libertarians, traditionalist conservatives, um, and anti-communist, and then you updated it with later on with neoconservatives and the religious right. So this is now the new group, isn't it, that you've got to update with populist conservatism? Yes, this is what's often called nationalist populism. And if you look at it just analytically, uh, Trumpism uh, in some ways is a challenge to each component of the traditional conservative movement as it developed under Buckley and ultimately in, uh, through Reagan. Uh, he, uh, his, his attitude toward trade, uh, trade uh, deals and protectionism, for example, uh, flies against the, the classical liberal libertarian limited government uh, uh, free trade philosophy. Um, he has shown uh, an interest in, in seeking the votes of social conservatives, but as you just said, uh, his, his kind of social conservatism is more uh, patriotic in, in, in general character doesn't have quite as much religious content, although he is you know, saying things that they have found acceptable enough to vote for him, especially given their perception of a, of a very uh, serious uh, and an unpalatable alternative. And then uh, if we think of the Cold Warriors and in the, and in the post-Cold War period, the national security hawks and so forth, he's challenging that with his, his skepticism about NATO, his, uh, his interest in having some better relationship with Putinist Russia and so forth. So all the way down the line, um, uh, he is, uh, Trumpism in some ways is intellectually challenging uh, what has been the, uh, the, the intellectual paradigm for at least you know, maybe a little too ritualistically uh, for conservatives in the last uh, two decades. And part of that uh, is centered in the Wall Street Journal editorial page, for example, its, it's preference for free trade and, and the like, and supply-side economics. And Trump there, we're not sure quite where he's coming out, um, but um, there, has been, there have been signs that he doesn't take that as a, uh, as a, uh, a perfect model for the future. So um, if you just look at, this, at what Trumpism represents thematically, or at least in its attitudes, we'll see how the policy unfolds. If you just look at it in the preliminary way of its attitudes and so on, it is a challenge to Reaganism. Now, I happen to think that uh, some of that may be accommodated. Uh, and I, I would say, and again, we're speaking in late November 2016, yeah. so yeah. Uh, things could change very right. quickly here right. in the next few months. But right now, I, I would not have thought on election eve that we would have the kind of opening that has now been provided by Republican retention of both houses of Congress and by Trump winning as he did. I'm not sure what will happen, but it seems to me that we could be on the verge of a conservative hundred days rather similar in impact to the New Deal 100 days of 1933. And um, I'm not, I wouldn't want to go further out on the limb than that, because after the first 100 days, who knows? But right now, uh, given the, the, the public willingness overall to give the guy a chance, and given some of his initial appointments, uh, Attorney General and so forth, um, that they would start meeting with general approbation on the right, uh, it, and given his uh, cordiality now, it seems, with 
Paul Ryan, who represents anti-Trumpism intellectually in many ways, um, given their cooperativeness, it may be that on certain selected issues having to do with the economy, and to some extent, I would say, on um, immigration and, and other issues, Supreme Court appointment, presumably, uh, there will be um, a a kind of cooperation, uh, if maybe not always amicable, between what we'll call the, the Reaganite residual Reaganism of the Republican yeah. Party and this Trumpist uh, phenomenon. I think uh, what what Trump has taught people, including conservative intellectuals, is that there is that there are needs out there that have been overlooked, and I. I I think that at a certain level of political accommodation and policy wonkery, um, there can be um, gestures made and attempts made through legislation to address what I call the grievances of the aggrieved. But a lot is going to depend, a lot is going to depend, I must underscore, uh, on the, the character, temperament, intellectual discipline, and personnel selections of the president-to-be. Um, and as we know, on an almost a daily basis, he is surprising us with with uh, some of his his seeming variations from things he said earlier in the campaign and so forth. So it's very unclear to me just how that's all going to shake out. But um, in my view, that if if Trump comes across in his early days as a as a fairly um, moderate president in the sense of no perpetual flamboyance and you know, Twitter wars and things like that that have gotten him a lot of, of publicity and I think earned him some some uh, you know uh, dismay among not only elites but uh, but even maybe potentially at the grassroots if he if he, in other words if he if he comes through as saying he's going to do what he wants to do but do it in a way that's not uh, over the top that Given that and the Republicans' eagerness to capitalize on their their majority while they have a president who is presumably going to be in sync with them much of the time, given all those factors, we could be seeing, rather remarkably, a a revival of conservative ideology yeah. uh, in some ways. And it, also, I would just want to say one more thing on this point. What struck me about Trump late in the campaign, in the last three or four weeks, when he started using a teleprompter and became less uh, uh, given to going off off message and so forth, he was really campaigning on themes that were, like, were likely to bring most Republicans, most conservatives together. You know, Supreme Court appointment, repeal and replace uh, Obamacare, and, and the like. And so I think that helped him put that coalition back together and draw enough people back together who had been disaffected earlier to help him squeak through. And it was a squeaker in the key yeah. states. I mean, yeah. uh, it was a surprising, and it, all the dominoes fell for him in just the right direction, but it was only 1% in Florida, 12,000 votes in Michigan, about 1% in Pennsylvania. These were not landslide victories, no. but they were enough to, to get him to the Electoral College majority. So I think that he, he helped himself by becoming, in a way, a little more conventionally conservative conservative late in the game. Now, we'll see whether he stays on that particular course, but I would argue that if he does in a way that isn't um, uh, going to um, uh, antagonize either his allies or his enemies overly in that early honeymoon phase, if, yeah. I don't think we're going to have much of a honeymoon, but no. relatively speaking, then there is the potential then for quite a lot of things to be done that conservatives will approve of. And I don't think they would have expected that uh, just a few yeah. weeks ago. Yeah, no, so you bring up a good point here. I mean, you think about the squeaker election, and it was sort of like, I remember, you know, coming home uh, from work on election day, and I, you know, had three different stations on, I had a lot of blogs open, and I'm just sort of monitoring everything, and it really took me aback when, you know, he started winning these states, particularly when they called Wisconsin. I remember almost falling off my feet uh, when they made that call. And it all sort of brings to mind, though, I think, and you think about Donald Trump being outspent and also not really putting into place what you think of as the typical infrastructure uh, uh, of a campaign to, to do that proper work, and yet he still wins. And putting that in mind with something you've said, uh, which is there are no gatekeepers anymore, and Donald Trump clearly realized that. I mean, much, really, if we think of the Democratic Party using social media so well, and all of the stories that came out of the 2012 election, how Obama had this sophisticated data operation that you know really beat the pants off the Romney campaign, which was in love with TV. 
And yet Trump, it seems to me, is the most effective uh, user of, and I, and I say social media, you know, it, it's just the idea of you can interact with people directly, uh, millions of people. And it all, it all seems to confirm something also uh, that we have to discuss in thinking about our politics and thinking about uh, conservatism, which is um, as long as you have the money and the network, uh, you can reach a lot of people very quickly without gatekeepers. Yes, there are no gates anymore. I mean, in the yeah. in the days of Buckley and National Review, uh, it was famously said that you know Buckley was the gatekeeper, so he could marginalize, uh, you know, kooks and anti-Semites and others and so forth, and kind of define what the conservative mainstream was. And now, uh, thanks to this revolution in communications technology through which we're living. Uh, it, uh, the iPhone and the internet and, and Twitter and Facebook. Twitter and Facebook didn't even exist 15 years ago. And I think you're quite right. Trump was able very effectively to use those new media. Those are media that are populist in their consequence. Yeah. They they empower people outside the credentialed classes. Uh, and again, there are no gates. So if you want to put a few hundred dollars into it, you can create your own website, I understand, and, and uh, have your, your uh, voice out there and try to attract attention. So I think that um, the, the technology of com- mass communication, the changing technology, which has had the effect of, of uh, making many more voices uh, um, uh, discernible, that uh, is a kind of a, a populist underpinning to what became a very effective Trump um, uh, operation. And um, he didn't need to spend the money. He was outspent hugely. And that is one of the stunning things. He was not only outspent hugely, but he didn't have the kind of ground game, as they say. And yet, because of his personality and his prior, I think, name recognition, as well as his message, one has to say, um, he appealed. And I want to go back then to something that a friend of mine in Pennsylvania told me the day after the election. Hillary Clinton won Philadelphia by 450,000 votes, I am told. Ordinarily, that would overwhelm anything the Republicans could amass in the small towns and small uh-huh. cities of central and western Pennsylvania. <clears throat> Trump managed to do so and came in with, I think, about a 75,000-vote majority. Well, according to my friend, in those counties out there outside of the Philadelphia area, Trump won the counties routinely with 60% of the vote. And in three counties, it was 80%. Uh-huh. And I remember thinking before the election that it could be close and that he had an outside chance. I did not really expect that all the dominoes would fall, as I said before. Um, But I did have the sense from his rallies that he was tapping into uh, a demographic that might just vote in in, um, record numbers and more monolithically than the traditional political polling models would have anticipated. And I thought this was a wild card, an imponderable. I remember writing to someone in an email a week before, I said, I don't think we can trust the polls because we just don't know who's going to vote and who's not. Yeah. And um, yeah. It, to my mind, it was almost a religious phenomenon in the sense of very uh, intense, very devoted to him, uh, the people who came out in those key states and tilted the balance in the Electoral College. And I, this reminds me of something H.L. Mencken is supposed to have said, although it may have been somebody else, uh, somebody else whom he was quoting, that in politics a man has to learn to rise above principle. Yeah. And, of course, that's re- reference to politicians. But in a sense, I think that many people at the grassroots, going back to our earlier conversation a little earlier, that many people at the grassroots were in a mood that they did not find the the old principles compelling. And so that is a challenge I think conservatives have to face going forward. How do you make the traditional conservative concerns with with freedom, uh, including economic freedom, religious freedom, the concern for community and tradition and 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 yeah. the, the historic uh, Judeo-Christian heritage and the concern for national security. How do you make those concerns, which I think everybody feels in their heart in one way or another, uh, as as goods to be uh, sought after? Um, uh, how do you make that appeal? in language that is relevant to today's millennials and the people in the Rust Belt and 
wherever. And yeah. I think the conservatives need to do some serious thinking about that. Now, with Trump in the White House, a lot of the attention, a lot of it, I'm sure, is going to be focused on whatever he says. Yeah. But that's where the, the but, elites, I think, have some work to do. But that sort of brings to mind, I, mean, I had a piece a few days ago in Real Clear Policy, uh, in which I argued, sort of building on some of the arguments you've heard from reform conservatives, that, you know, and I kind of compare Donald Trump with Theresa May, uh, the British Prime Minister Theresa May. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, in, and, and if you read her Conservative Party conference address, and it's been really criticized by a lot of people, but what I, what I saw in the address is she clearly understands she's not Margaret Thatcher. And she understands that her, um, her opportunity, her greatness, uh, will not be defined just by or in cutting taxes, cutting regulations, uh, you know, things like that, those typical conservative things. Because in a way, there's been dissipation. Uh, there's been a letting go or a, a no, uh, you know, no longer do, is there a continuity of meaning uh, within uh, British society uh, with regards to sort of core goods? And her task, as she, she understands it, and I think you see it in the address, is to rebuild those things, as to rebuild sort of a, a British uh, identity uh, and citizenship. And that is part of the lesson of Brexit. And, and so she clearly understands that. And I think likewise with Trump, not, not as much, because clearly Trump comes in and there's this idea he's going to cut uh, some regulations. He's going to cut out some things that Obama did. Uh, and, and, and conservatives want him to do that. But his moment is also similar, I think, in a, a call for rebuilding, um, uh, in many respects, rebuilding institutions. And, you, you know, how does one do that? And it seems there are ideas out there, particularly from, I think, the reform conservatives of uh, a relational uh, personal identity or rebuilding sort of middle layers of society in very careful ways that government might support or incentivize that approach. Yeah, I think we're going to hear uh, a, a lot about the, the use of government now. Uh, that seems to be what's happening under Prime Minister May uh, and also uh, some of, of, of the Trump priorities, uh, for example, the, the whole building of, of infrastructure and so forth, uh, is not what you think of as small government uh, conservatism or or whatever. Uh, and that's that's going to be a challenge, at least at an intellectual level, to how to combine mm -hmm. them. Because the, the people of, of the classical liberal and limited government persuasion would say, look, if you cut the regulations, you are going to lead, uh, say, regulations on energy production, for example, you're going to lead to more jobs for the kind of people who are feeling left behind. Uh, and so it's not uh, all or nothing, yeah. and uh, but there is a kind of, I think, a kind of sense out there from a lot of the Trump electorate that uh, government was working against them. Now they want to make government work for them, and that's a little different from the yeah. traditional conservative emphasis, saying, "Well, let's. It'll be better off if government doesn't work for anybody, and it reverts to being an umpire rather than a busybody." And so um, it remains to be seen how that works out in practical uh let me know, like, let me like, ask you i want to ask you george just think about your uh experience you're you're a scholar of herbert hoover uh, you also know a lot about calvin coolidge's presidency so let's just sort of think uh about so this condition of say the white working class in eastern ohio or western pennsylvania or in west virginia uh wisconsin michigan these places on one level you know, it, it seems a stretch to think that manufacturing jobs or those sorts of highly remunerative jobs are going to come back to those areas. I mean, as much as they've been lost to free trade, they've also been lost to, um, to automation, uh, to, to improvements in technology and productivity and output. But could one see something like a, a Coolidge approach where you have very low income taxes, uh, few people pay them, you have low to non-existent corporate income taxes, and the same thing with regard to capital gains taxes, and that sort of creates all sorts of opportunities uh, for, for jobs to reemerge. But then also, it seems to me under those presidents, you, had, you did have tariffs. So you had, you had low taxes in a lot of areas where we now have significant taxes, uh, but you also had tariffs where we have very low tariffs now under, under post-Cold War free trade regime. Yeah, I, 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 speaking here as a citizen, I, I don't pretend to be a, an academic economist. I'm a historian. And, and um, I just, I just ask that as something, I, just thinking yeah. out loud about, yeah. you know, what we have done in the past versus what we're doing now and what could work. Well, I, I would make two points. One, uh, I, I, speaking as a citizen, I don't see that 
jobs are man- magically going to come back from Korea or Mexico no, or no, wherever no, and repopulate the landscape of Ohio. However, my understanding is that of the tax code is that if if the corporate tax rate can be uh, lowered and so on, some of the money that's been outsourced uh, through what they call what inversion mm-hmm. um, can perhaps be be uh, encouraged to come back here and then invested in different enterprises. So uh, uh, over some time, uh, a uh, a new economy can be built up or a revived economy. I suspect that the the, the trade deal business will probably end up with... uh, something like more bilateral deals, things like that, uh, that uh, will not be a gr- a grandiose in one direction, either pro-free trade or just reversion to protectionism. Um, and I, I just learned the other day, for example, I, I asked uh, someone who would know, uh, why are there 5,000 pages in this Trans-Pacific Agreement? And he said, well, because every single item uh, that's being imported, export has got its own little little uh, um, um, section of the bill, and everything has to be uh, kind of f- f- uh, finagled to determine how much can be imported and exported. So that it's not really a free trade agreement in the sense of just slashing the quotas, slashing right, the tariffs, right. and let the trade flow. No, it's like a whole multitude of little trade deals, as I understand it. Yeah. And that's why it's so prolix and and complex. So um, I, I I suspect that we'll, we I'm not sure quite what to expect there from Trump. Uh, he's certainly talking protectionist uh, talk, and uh, and we'll see what transpires. But I think the one thing that economically might make some difference would be to restructure the tax code in a way that would encourage American yeah. firms with profits to invest in America and not hide them in Ireland or someplace. You know, see, so yeah. uh, that that might have some. Uh, practical impact. And again, part of, I have to emphasize again, part of the phenomenon of the Rust Belt is the feeling of cultural disrespect. And so that's harder to uh, accommodate by any political gimmicks like refiguring the tax codes and so on. But I have a feeling that if Trump uh, stays in touch with those people, that that in itself will give them a feeling that they're at the table again. Yeah, and yeah. so without necessarily saying here are the seventeen uh, little uh, changes in the law that we are now proposing to help Northern Ohio, he gives those people a feeling that they have a voice, and I think that is a healthy development yeah. uh, in the election, um, regardless of you know how well, how we implement well, it. Well, you It'll know, be, it's interesting yeah. too. I mean, I was thinking in this regard. You know, after Hurricane Katrina. Um, there were all sorts of caveats and exceptions created in the federal tax code to encourage business back into New Orleans, uh, southern Mississippi, these places that were affected by the hurricane, sort of tax-free zones, uh, if I recall. And I remember uh, there were a lot of business opportunities created. I wonder if we might see something like that for those areas. Um, it's possible. I, yeah, I, who knows? I, I just don't know. Yeah. Um, uh, the, just what will emanate from this whole <clears throat> uh, surge now of, of Republican uh, legislation. I, it seems like Paul Ryan and the House de- uh, Republicans are, are jubilant because, after all, they can pass a bill. The Republicans can pass something in the Senate. They can reconcile the two and have all sorts of little features uh, that will uh, be of, of general um, yeah. you know, uh, of, of, of interest to uh, conservatives on the whole, I would say. Uh, so uh, we'll have to watch the fine print here. Uh, uh, see how that Qu- all... Question for you. I mean, we've been talking a lot about what this means for American conservatism, uh, but think, situating Trump more broadly, globally. Uh, you know, I just had a conversation with a Polish uh, professor, Spazimir Domorodzki, and thinking about uh, there, are, there are no center-left party members sitting right now currently uh, in the Polish parliament. There are, uh, you know, throughout, you know, we have Hungary revolting against the European Union, we have, uh, you know, what's happened in Britain with the not only Theresa May and Brexit, but the implosion of the Labour Party. It appears the French presidential uh, contest will be between Marine Le Pen, a hard right nationalist figure, and then a center right figure. And we look at uh, the Democratic Party added its incredibly low uh, ebb of, of its influence. The Republican Party is, is riding high. Is this, I mean, is there something else? happening here? Uh, I mean, and, and one level we say, yes, there is, but what is that precisely? Do we see something like a post, you know, Trump is more broadly situated than a post-Cold War period that is ending, uh, characterized by trade, 
globalism, um, you know, uh, free movement of peoples. All, all of this is sort of coming to an end. It's not so. It's it's sort of post post Cold War that we're entering into as well. Um, well, one point I would make uh, in answer to your question is that we are living for, through a period where the velocity of change is is staggering. Uh, I've already alluded to the velocity of, of change in the field of mass communication. But also, uh, as I've indicated in some of my recent writings, what we're seeing here uh, in the so-called globalization phenomenon is an intermingling, not just of goods and services being traded across borders, but a an intermingling of peoples and cultures through mass migration. I think it is correct to say that there are more people on the move in the world than at any time in the history of the, of the human race. And more and more of them are making, are making the United States and, and, and to a certain degree Europe now their destination. And this produces all sorts of, of stresses. Uh, you just don't intermingle peoples and cultures without having misperceptions, feelings of competition, etc. Uh, you have uh, difficulties. You, you need time for adjustment and assimilation or historically assimilation in this country. I, I understand that a million people are coming into the United States legally yeah. every year. That's more than any other yeah. country accepts. Yeah. There are 800,000 Chinese students in American colleges and universities as we speak, and over a million from, if you add up Saudi Arabia and other uh, countries as well. That's, that's incredible. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but it is... It's just staggering, in, in, and, so, and so you have this, I think this leads to a feeling which was felt most acutely perhaps in the Rust Belt, but more broadly, that things are just moving awfully fast. And there is also a, a distrust, which I would share, actually, at, 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 uh, of, of global elites or transnational progressive types thinking the nation state is outmoded yeah. and uh, we can have a government by experts from above uh, through administrative decree if we can't get the you know, retrograde legislatures to go along and there's been a reaction against that a reaction of people saying no the united states is a is a country of we the people as reagan said and as our constitution starts off by saying so I think that is a an international phenomenon that Trump represents one part of it. Um, I would say UKIP in England and yeah. other parties in Europe represent the same impulse. Sometimes it's harder edged and, and so yeah. forth than in, in some places and in some circumstances and elsewhere. And one has to try to merge this, in my view, with constitutionalist yeah. principles and the 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 under underlying values that we have as a nation so uh it's uh this is a phenomenon that can have a rough side as well as a possibly beneficial side in the sense of restraining this kind of 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 gallop that we've had towards some kind of vague uh, borderless world where the people who have the uh, the uh, elite status and, and, and good jobs and good government positions can kind of manage everything for the rest of us, you see. And yeah. so there's been a rebellion against that, which I think is natural and can be uh, healthy. And it may be that we are going to go through a period now in Europe and elsewhere of a kind of of reassessment of what seem to be just accepted truths about uh, the yeah. internationalism of the post-war period. That's going to produce, I think, a lot of, of uh, excitement. I don't expect to see an era of good feelings emerge on the horizon in the next few weeks or months, uh, either here or abroad. Uh, but it's uh, it's a, an argument that uh, is, is being made, and I think that it's incumbent upon elites, as, including conservative intellectual elites, to address this and assess it without falling into the kind of of hyper nationalism uh, ethno nationalism yeah. racialism that that exists at least on the fringe of, of some of these phenomena and that's that's something that i, I yeah. uh, would say should should be uh, resisted yeah no and, and, kind of no and and when I ask you that question I, I of course mean that also and I, you know, there is an ambiguity there as to how these parties what they actually want particularly in Europe and some of these countries that are strongly resisting. Uh, you know the latest edict from the European Union, particularly with regard to migration. I think of I think of Hungary uh, strongly here, um, but then also sort of the movements we're seeing in France and Italy as well. So we don't know, and they probably don't know what they want long term. There's just right now a reaction against the disrespect of of their national borders and sovereignty yes. uh, in that regard. But there's also I, I I think a post World War II institutional question of NATO. 
uh, the, and then the initial foundations for the EU were laid in, in the aftermath of World War II, also GATT, the United Nations. Do these institutions themselves, in my mind, are they just no longer we, can we really see a use uh, or a meaning uh, for these institutions now? And so those are actually uh, without a lot of steam or without a lot of purpose. And, and Trump is also fits quite nicely uh, into that as well. That seems to me uh, also on the table. And it, and it seems also, where does the left go from here? Uh, uh, there's no sort of push I can see for a collectivist uh, progressivism amongst majorities. And so where does that leave the left? Does it now move in a very left-wing populist direction as well? Well, there seem to be signs of that. I, I live in an area where there are many colleges, and I'm, in a, and I'm speaking to you from the state of Massachusetts, which, of course, went heavily for the candidate of the Democrats. Massachusetts uh, values are quite strong still. Yes, and so uh, one thing that is a concern to me is that as we make the transition into uh, what may be a rather lively uh, new administration under Trump, you know, lively in the sense of you know media, you know coverage and so forth, um, that there is going to be a pushback, um, not just in Congress, but I, I I am concerned that it will be on the streets. And already we are hearing serious talk about major marches on Washington on January 20th, the inauguration day, uh, and. And, and this may or may not materialize in um, ungovernable proportions, but it it could produce some 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 tense moments, especially in some of the cities. I, what I sense on the left is the fear that I the sort of the other side of the coin. There are many on the on the right who are afraid of what kind of of. Um, of, of government would uh, come out of a Clinton administration. There are now those on the left who who claim to fear that uh, Trump is going to deport everybody on the day one and and do things that uh, will uh, you know violate the Constitution in egregious ways. And so they they have they have a, a very high level of anxiety right now. And I I do worry that some of that anxiety will be expressed in ways that are messy uh, and and turbulent and potentially violent um, in in the coming yeah. months. Yeah. Uh, so that that that's I hope that we don't end up with that kind of a polarization uh, effect. But uh, there are certainly yeah. some portents that uh, should give us concern. George Nash, thank you so much for your time today in discussing the contemporary state of American conservatism. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. This is your host, Richard Reinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.